feeling better. Yeah. Less pain in the neck. Right. You can pop up easier with less headaches. Yeah. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh -huh. This is my patient, Ray. Ray suffers from neck and back pain. He has headaches. He specifically has headaches when he goes from a recumbent lying down to an upright position. He suffers from a condition called syncope. This is where you have a decrease in blood pressure, which can lead to a loss of consciousness. He has fatigue. His fatigue comes in two forms, a body fatigue and a brain fatigue. He's done tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, and he suffered from two IED attacks. Ray came to my office because of neck and back pain and headaches. He did not come in for the other conditions. Luckily for Ray, I have an understanding of what impact the type of traumas he suffered in the past, specifically in Iraq and Afghanistan, will have upon his health. I'd like to publicly thank Ray for allowing me to do this video, his service in our military, and for those of you watching, let's get into his case. Improvised explosive devices. Blast injuries are one of the most common causes of traumatic brain injury on the battlefield today. Blast injuries are caused by the impact from a complex pressure wave generated by an explosion. The explosion causes an instant rise in pressure, which creates a blast wave. This wave starts at the site of the explosion and travels outward. Blast injuries can occur when the blast wave hits the body. Air-filled organs such as the ears, lungs, stomach, and intestines are particularly at risk for blast injuries. This is also true for organs that are surrounded by fluid, such as the brain and the spine. A blast is a shockwave that travels through the air supersonically. Most people are familiar with it in the case of a supersonic jet, that big sonic boom that they hear. But it also occurs after explosions and can travel out far away from the, you know, the, the typical fireball that you see. You could just be standing there and kind of feel like a pressure pulse and feel a little shaken up, but fine. The focus of my work has been trying to understand brain injuries from explosions in the military setting. Um, and what we know from the, the human experience is that people who do experience, go through explosive events, they're predisposed to later development of uh, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's or mental health abnormalities like anxiety and depression. But we don't really know what's happening between the explosion and those things, which can appear weeks to years later. In this video, what it's demonstrating is when that pressure wave comes across and hits the balloons filled with water, which is a representation of our brains, the brain can suffer from blunt force trauma and axonal shearing. As the brain moves back and forth within the skull, areas of varying density in the brain slide over each other at different speeds. Axons crossing these junctions experience tremendous shearing forces causing them to stretch and tear from the cell body. This event is called axonal shearing or diffuse axonal injury. Brain damage can continue to occur for hours or days after the initial injury. Or years. Close inspection of an area of the outer surface of the brain and inner surface of the skull during the initial impact shows the soft, fragile brain scraping against the hard, jagged inner surfaces of the skull to create shearing forces. As the gray matter, comprised of cell bodies, and the white matter, comprised of axons, are of two different densities, the shearing forces create a plane of cleavage where many axonal injuries occur. The axons may be completely torn, partially torn, or separated from their connections with other cells. Thousands or even millions of scattered axons may be torn. So with this in mind, remember, Ray came in for these two conditions. If we rearrange this pattern to more accurately represent what his issues are, it's not the tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's that he suffered two IED attacks. And we know now that we're technically calling that a IED brain blast injury. That injury actually affected, first and foremost, his ability to make energy, which means this is going to translate into him having a brain fatigue. The brain fatigue is going to cause the loss of muscles in their coordination or their synchronization, which is going to lead to a body fatigue. The body fatigue is going to cause those muscles to not work properly, leading to neck and back pain because the muscles are strained or overworking which will contribute to his headaches. His syncope, which is an autonomic condition, either due to a dysautonomia, a vasovagal response, or some other unknown underlying condition, 
I'm going to go into his case with the assumption that we can correct that. We actually won't know until the end of care. I'm a chiropractor, and like a lot of us chiropractors, we're going to access the brain through the patient's body using chiropractic. If we can improve brain function, 10% of the brain's output deals with muscles, and 90% of the brain's output deals with autonomics. Heart rate, heart rhythm, breathing, peristalsis, temperature control, that's, those are the autonomic things. If I can improve Ray's brain, I will improve his muscles' ability to work, to coordinate, and to be in synchronization. This will allow Ray to have more energy. He won't have as much fatigue. He'll have decreased neck and back pain and decreased headaches. If we can correct his autonomics, hopefully I'll be able to positively affect his syncope. Now getting up. Uh, it was a lot easier than it was yesterday. Because yesterday, and since my fall, when I'd get up, my neck muscles would engage as I got up, causing severe pain. It was less as time went on throughout the day. So, you're feeling better. Yeah. Less pain in the neck. Right. You can pop up easier with less headache. Let's see what you got, you ready? Yep. You push up, go. Wonderful. Try again, push up. Good. Push up. Good. Push up. Good. Push up for me. Up, 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 up. Push up. So on those tests, you actually want them to be weak. Oh. Yeah, push out for me. Like you want that one weak and it's not. Push out. You want that weak and it's not. Push up. You want this weak and it's not. Push up. So what does it tell you? Or what does it say? It tells me that your system is not inhibiting properly. Oh. So this is why your stress and your anxiety levels are going to be high. Gotcha. This is a flexor withdrawal reflex of the palm. That right quad should be inhibited, as should the left one. These are abnormal. So we're probably gonna adjust in the same spot that we adjusted to yesterday. We'll see what impact it has. So the C7 has a huge impact on what we call the spinal ganglia and it feels like they're stress symptoms. So now these reflexes are normal after mobilizing the C7 area. Good. Go. Okay, so this is what we want on you. We'll give it a nap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right? Oh, good. That was different. I was really trolling. <laughs> <laughs> so we do a little bit of trigger point work on you. Calm you down. How'd you feel after your eye treatment yesterday that we did? Uh, in the moment, it was it was different, um, but as time went on, I, I felt fine. Actually, I did a 5.2 mile walk yesterday. Really? I did. It felt amazing. So you haven't been able to do that? I did it in the past, maybe a couple of years ago. You're saying you could finally do it again after Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, it's been, it's been a long while. That must feel really exciting. I love it. Walking was always my thing. Um, it's what I use to calm down. It was one of my tools that I would use during my anxiety. So are you saying that treatment's helping you do more? Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, just to, I guess, give you an example. Yesterday, uh, even after the treatment, I was able to do my, my 5.2 mile walk, huh? and then I was able to move my stuff. Like you could do more activity. Right. <laughs> That's wonderful. And usually that walk would have put me out. But I was actually able to partake in moving some of my stuff. So, I mean, good. I'm Perfect. moving in the right direction. Good. The 
velocity of this adjustment and its magnitude is not appropriate for a large portion of the population. It is appropriate for Ray at this stage of his treatment. It was like a sudden shock type deal. I'm sure. <laughs> Still tender? Uh, not as much as it was before you cracked. Should I push up? So his lower reflexes are normal, however his top to bottom are, that right one is still not working properly, which tells me something's out. So I'm going to go back and adjust his hand and his elbow. And now the reflex is normal. You okay? Oh, I'm good. I was trying so hard to hold it up. All right, let's do a couple things. I'm going to give you some samples today of some stuff. Okay. I have to be cautious with you that we don't... I want your ability to make energy to be higher uh, without making you nervous. Okay. You get it? Mm -hmm. So caffeine's a good example of a product that will make give you more energy but bring you anxiety. Okay. Okay. We don't want to do that with your system. Okay. You need more energy to do more, but you don't need to be pushing into a state of being anxious or having any stress. Right. Make sense? Yeah. So just give me some small stuff today and see what impact it has. Okay. Here I'm teaching a chiropractic continuing education class via Zoom. So see me talking to the monitor as I talk with a colleague of mine about Ray's case. And he'll just kind of lose it and fall backwards. Do you want to tell that story? It's uh, nerve wracking for me that I'll just randomly lose my balance. So he's finally able to walk five miles, you said yesterday? Yeah, 5.2. And so he's, he's, he's getting the capacity to do more care so he can walk more and still continue to work afterwards without feeling fatigued. So today I'm gonna treat him some more. I'm gonna check his TMJ. We're gonna do some optokinetics. I want to put them on a few supplements, some turmeric, boswellia, and some uh, trisomal glutathione today to see what impact it has. Sir, thank you for your service. You're welcome. Pleasure, Ray. So when Ray first came in, he was having uh, all facilitation of was not having his normal inhibitory responses, and so. He's having his normal inhibitory responses now, which is what I want to see. And he's feeling better. He's having less body pain. He can get up from a laying position up without his neck hurting. How's your sleep? It's definitely changing. Because before, like every hour and a half, I noticed I would get up to reposition myself and then I would be able to fall back asleep. But it's every night, every hour and a half, roughly, changing. But I've noticed since our treatments that I'm able to go a little bit longer and a little bit longer. Like last night, I, I think I went to bed at, at, at close to midnight. I didn't wake up till I think it was 4.45 in the morning. And you're saying that's longer, that's longer periods of sleep? Yeah. And my dreams are so vivid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot different than I've had before. 
Let's put it that way. Well, I'm glad you found our office. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I always ask patients is, how did you find my office? Did you do an extensive search? Maybe you found my YouTube channel, came across one of my teaching videos and thought that that might be something you'd like to try and asked Ray and he said, no. I said, well, maybe you saw one of our Google reviews where patients were happy about our care and the treatment we delivered. And Ray said, no. I said, maybe you came across one of our blog posts and pictures I put up throughout the years to demonstrate who it is we are and what we do. He said, no. Dr. Algie, I called the VA and they sent me to you. Regardless of how you found my office, I want you to know you're in good hands. This is a little optokinetic to see what's happening with Ray's eyes. He has a tendency to lose the ability to focus about halfway through the second stroke. Muscle testing is graded from a zero to five scale. The average resistance being around a three to a four when a doctor is testing a patient. Push up. Up, up, up. Ray has a zero on this oh, test. You okay? Yeah. It always feels so weird. <sighs> so he's been falling backwards for no reason. So we're trying to see what impact our optic kinetic will have on him. You all right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Ray, right, push towards me. Go. So he had such a loss of strength that this might be playing into his syncope because he's totally disorientated for a moment. So I wanted to check his TMJ, found a strong muscle, put in some tongue depressors and went back and all his muscles inhibited. I went and treated his TMJ and then we're going to go back and redo the optokinetics and see what impact it has upon his system. Go, Ray, go! Try this one again. Go. We're gonna do your TMJ first. Give me that open for me. Relax, should you ask? Relax. Here I'm doing some trigger point work on his internal pterygoids and his masseter muscles. We'll do the external muscles as well, temporalis masseter, muscles under the jaw, and we'll see how that impacts his bite. I'm also going to be having him open his mouth. Now what I like to see is where the muscle testing correlates with what we see visually. That is not always the case. TMJ deviates to the right, and also the tongue depressor has facilitated all his muscles being on the right, and I like to see those things in sync. Great, open for me. Close. Open. Close. Okay. I want you just to remember this pain, okay? Mm -hmm. The intensity. We're going to come back and check it when we're done. Alright, one more time open for me. Okay, close. Open for me. Close. And close. Open. You get warm again? <laughs> that one made me warm. When patients get warm, it's an indication that they've been out of place for a long time and we're stimulating the brain, causing this sweat response, which happens globally. Good. All right. All right. You got warm on that one, huh? <laughs> Very warm. You feel that normal? Not as much right now. So here, following up after treatment, his eyes track with the optokinetics better. Try this one for me, ready? Go. Wonderful. Okay. Go walk for me and say. One of the things I'll do in my practice is have a patient do something they can't do, and then after treatment, we'll see if they can do it. All right. You want me to try and get up? I do. Yeah, I didn't have any pain with that. Okay, good. Uh, like none. Good. Well, that's what we want. <laughs>